Welcome to the Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay in Washington, and welcome to another episode of the Real News Debate. Today we're debating, would a massive investment in clean energy transform the American economy and create jobs? Joining us to debate today is Fred Smith. Fred is a president and founder of Competitive Enterprise Institute, a free market public policy group in Washington. And from 72 to 78, Fred served as senior analyst at the Environmental Protection Agency. And Bob Poland. Bob's the co-director of the Perry Institute in Amherst, Massachusetts. And Bob has, is a, one of the economists who's been leading the charge on modeling and researching what a massive investment in clean energy would mean to the U.S. economy. Thank you both for joining us. Thank you for having me. So, Bob, let's start. What, what has your research shown? Well, the basic point is if you spend money on anything, anything, don't even mention green, you will create jobs. Uh, so if you spend on a green investments, such as retrofitting buildings, other energy efficiency investments, such as uh, public transportation, as well as renewable energy, solar, wind power, uh, my research shows that on average you will create about 17 jobs per million dollars of expenditure. So it's not a question of creating jobs, it's how many. So 17 jobs per million dollars and then you also get the environmental benefits. By contrast, if you continue with the fossil fuel structure that we have, we just keep running it, we spend a million dollars on fossil fuels, we get five jobs per million dollars of expenditure. So the transition to a clean energy economy will generate three times more jobs per dollar of expenditure than maintaining our existing energy structure. Good. I think the, that, uh, that argument would be a great argument for going back to organic gardening rather than that because organic gardening certainly will involve many more jobs per unit of food produced. The question of investment and how do you allocate it across an economy is not per se creating jobs, it's creating wealth because wealth is the, we're after all, we're trying to be a wealthier society and whether, and we use that wealth to buy things we don't have today and that creates investment opportunities. The economies of the world that have tried to politicize those investment decisions, and maybe you're not trying to politicize it, maybe just saying you think green's better than non-green. That's a market issue. I mean, I don't really think there's much debate at this okay, point fine. because if we accept as serious what, say, 80% of climate scientists say, that we face potential ecological catastrophe if we don't dramatically reduce our carbon emissions over the next generation. I mean, they, they could be wrong, but I'm not willing to gamble. But that's, not, but that's not your point, I think. You're not arguing that we could waste money because you're no. frightened of climate change. You're arguing you believe independently of climate change, this issue should be resolved in a green direction rather than a market direction. No, 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 it's not green or market. And by the way, uh, the, the, I'm not against using private uh, market incentives at all. I'm for it. Uh, I th what my fundamental point is, we have to undergo this transition to a, a green economy. We have to. And that, therefore, it, it so happens in doing so, it is going to be a large generator of jobs. Why and do, so we, that why do we have to? Why do we have to? Uh, because if you take science seriously. Oh, okay. You believe that environmental issues require us to do it. So independently of whether it makes sense or not, we ought to do it. I, I believe that uh, as an economist, I take it as an insurance issue. I don't know that the 80% of the climate scientists are right. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's 98%. They could be wrong. Mm -hmm. But I take what they say seriously enough, so then I say, well, how much am I willing to pay for insurance? One of the worst, one of the worst problems with these debates is the idea that their side is for insurance and those who are questioning politicization of energy economy are wrong is the insurance argument. As I, the analogy I would draw is when the Titanic hit the iceberg and sunk, obviously we had to think careful and insure against those risks in the future. We didn't do it by getting the U.S. and British Navy to go out and sink icebergs. We did it by, by rerouting ships, by being better about where icebergs were, and by adapting to a world where icebergs were a risk. The way we need to address to change, climate change, any other change, is essentially freeing up the genius of the peoples, not by having politicians second guess and divert resources from where you can make money to resources where you lose money. Except, as we know, uh, the environmental effects 
of burning fossil fuels are not captured in market prices. This is what we always hear. Externalities are an excuse. <laughs> Externalities are an excuse. No, it's true. Externalities I mean, are an excuse for expanding government. Externalities are a fact of a relationship, and the question of what to do about them does not necessarily mean expanding government. I, I, as I said, I agree, and I think, and, and it's a fact that most of the green economy is going to be built through private investment, and I support uh, supporting private investment. But we also have to recognize that uh, burning fossil fuels is ruining the economy. Well, you and believe that, that is not. You believe that. Well, I, I don't believe, believe that. that. I believe that. Uh, you know, and most Americans don't believe that, as you well, know from the polling data. But, but that is not. That's 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 let's, yeah. let's, let's take. Let's take. You disagree on the underlying science, but the thesis here is that there should be government-led policy that facilitates both government and private investment. Mm -hmm. yeah. And if you do that in the clean energy sector, the net uh, consequences on the economy, Bob's argument, are positive. Right. So g just give us some specific examples of what that would be, and then, then Fred can respond. Well, the most, uh, the most obvious example sitting there right now is in investing in energy efficiency in buildings. Buildings consume about 40% of all of our overall energy in the United States now. And uh, it's, uh, uh, I think it's pretty well demonstrated across various kinds of studies that investing in energy efficiency now will uh, pay for itself in a matter of two to three years or four years. The problem as to why it hasn't happened is we don't have an adequate system of risk sharing, of, uh, of, of incentivizing and getting the market going. Once the market gets going, I think it'll be uh, self-generating. And as a result, we will save a lot in terms of oil consumption, energy consumption. We will uh, do the environment well by reducing fossil, f by reducing carbon emissions. And it's a big generator of employment. And so I think that should be the single focus, the biggest focus of uh, a recovery program, and that's, I wrote that in a study, Green Recovery, a couple of years ago. This, this is the argument, I think, that we hear over and over again, This debate, not just this debate, but a whole array of debates. The market is not perfect. The market has its failures, and therefore, prudent, wise intervention by brilliant intellectuals and government officials can guide us in a better direction towards a more perfect world. It's a wonderful theory, but the same reasons that make it hard for all efficiency gains to be realized right away. One reason, of course, is is that the, the vintage of all technologies, building being one of the examples, spans over 100 years. Buildings built today will be built very much more energy efficient because now we know a lot more. The cost of energy has become more obvious in groups, and so those buildings. That does not mean that retrofitting all the buildings in the world is a good idea. And it also means that our goal should be to ensure that we do nothing to slow down the replacement of existing technologies, buildings, and so forth with new ones. When we go in with a politicized strategy first, we always have the fact that it'd be an idiot to invest my money today. Congress is considering a subsidy program. I'll wait a year or two years and so forth, and then I'll get it free. And that's, that can- By politicized that, strategy, you mean any strategy driven by government? No, I mean a strategy that basically says, we don't think you'd do it unless we bribed you to do it. So we'll use taxpayer money to get you to do something which we think is in your best interest, but you're too stupid or too unwise okay, to do it. Well, the, 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 again, the underlying problem with the environment is that market forces do not capture the, uh, the severity of the effects. I mean- A government can? Well, we don't have any other choice. I, I, I'm, I'm with you. I mean, I, I don't think government does things perfectly, and I don't think brilliant intellectuals are going to do a whole lot better. We're both aware of the fatal conceit problem. There right? you go. Exactly. <laughs> okay. So we have, you know, screw up intellectuals. We have screw up government. But we also have this massive environmental problem, and you need some public policy. You need some market force to establish standards as to how we're going to protect the environment for the future. And... It so happens, and I don't actually think it's really debatable at, at this point, I, I don't think you debated it, is that by in doing these investments in clean energy, they are uh, more labor intensive, they will engage people, in, and therefore it's a good recovery program. I have heard the argument many times that, okay, well then well, let's go back to horse and buggies to create a lot of jobs. 
But that's, you know, that's kind of uh, trivializing what is a well, serious it's forward. totally trivializing. When I was at EPA, we were talking about earlier, my formative experience, and maybe government doesn't work as well as I thought when I was right out of graduate school. EPA, tell you what, just uh, for the audience, too, if you look at me, you get a better camera oh, sorry, angle yeah. over here. Uh, Otherwise, it's good yeah, you're talking yeah, yeah. to each other, I, I but I want people to yeah, see yeah. your eyes. One, yeah. of, uh, one of the areas, and this goes back to my formative experience as a young utopian planner in EPA, we were into the energy program then too. We were going to create a whole new source of energy things, trash to gas, methane recovery, pyrolysis, um, a whole biomass. We spent the quarter program, by, uh, the SINFUELS program, synthetic fuels, SINFUELS, a nice term. We spent $8 billion over a number of years trying to create energy, green jobs, energy from waste and so on. We created maybe eight barrels of oil. It was one of the greatest boondoggles in history and all the things I've talked about. We slowed down innovation because nobody was going to invest in But I want you to respond to Bob's point that market me mechanisms on their own do not capture the consequences of bi successful businesses that are making money, but the consequences of what they're doing harms the environment. Yeah. So, that, no, but, so the only thing that's going to make them change is public opinion, but, but public opinion has to be exercised through government. I assume that's what you're saying. So okay. you got to respond to that. It's a wonderful argument. It doesn't work in practice because no institution captures all the benefits or suffers all the co negatives of what they do. Markets, let's look at energy efficiency, which I think is... No, but hang on. No, 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 if McDonald's no, has a bad hamburger, somebody will sue them over the bad hamburger. It's not so easy for someone to sue some energy company. And by the way, suing McDonald's over a hamburger, you need to have a justice system that will oh, yeah, enable yeah. them to get Let some me explain. A, a, a system of legal, a legal structure and property rights is the way to address all issues, including environment. For the last, this is a lot much longer debate, but the progressive era in the 1890s essentially diverted the evolution of property rights and wildlife, streams, lakes, which was beginning to happen in both England and the United States. Same phenomenon occurred. And then after that, we decided for a while that the resources were to be exploited. Uh, Gifford Pinchot, this, this is a whole natural resource. And then, a hundred years later, we look at it and we say the market doesn't seem to be adequately compensating for this. Markets without property rights are an illusion, and our refusal to allow the evolution of property rights certainly has weakened our ability to handle environmental problems. So you're saying sooner or later the market will deal with this? No, only if the institutions that make it possible for markets to do that. And the well, issue don't is have climate a change rate, but a very difficult question. But simple little areas like species, wildlife. Why hasn't wildlife been in, incorporated but into the ownership? The Great system? Lakes have been cleaned up without regulation. Well, let, let's be. Let's look at what exactly happened. The the clean air in America was cleaned up a long time before EPA came in. It happened partly because of technological change, as we went from incon inconvenient fuels like coal in your fireplace to natural gas and electricity and other things, and local governments and local jurisdictions moved in with clean air ordinances. Local so government. I didn't. I didn't. No, no, say no, that no, that no, 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 no. But the thing is, yeah. to a large extent, by overly centralizing policy, we make it. We make. We run the great risk that when you make lots of little mistakes, you correct them. When you make one gigantic no, mistake at the federal government level, which we're about to do, okay, but are trying a very to do in the green point energy, here, which you got to respond to, or Bob, maybe you want to go at it again. The issue is, the, I mean, well, can we put it back to you? Fred's saying that government can't interfere in this. It's not. It's not effective if government. Well, and so this issue that you're raising isn't I'm well. Sure. Look, I, can't make I mean, we all, there we also have some I, very powerful counterexamples. Government doesn't always screw up. Not always. Uh, in terms of the development of technologies in this country, uh, government has played the central, the central role in the formation of uh, jet aviation industry and in the computer and the internet. The you know, if we had to pick three of the most important technical innovations, and this is not my work, I mean, this is uh, work by, you know, leading re researchers on the issue of technical change. A, a little fine point there. I, when I started my professional career, this issue was hot, it comes up and goes, should government fund basic research or should government fund applied research? In a way, you're talking about applications of research, energy efficiency. The Department of Defense and the National Science Foundation each had their hobby horse. NSF wanted basic research, DOD wanted applied research, because that was sort of what they were most interested in. They did two wonderful reports, Project Consight and Project Traces. What are the origins of innovation? 
And not surprisingly, each came up with the answer that benefited their agency. The point is that innovations occur in an extremely complicated way, but we know one thing. They come about best when the individual making the innovation gains the benefits and uh, suffers the kind. Residual claimants are critical. When you bring subsidies into it, you still may or may not realize the benefits, but you now re realize much less of the cost. It weakens the incentives to make innovation work. Green technology has lots of promise. It might actually become part of the world's future. But when you force feed it, when you allow people to get profit side capitalism and law side socialism, whether it's green or anything else, is a very dangerous model for piloting America into the future. And I'm very much afraid this whole green job thing is so already beset with corruption, the ethanol crisis, where corruption is totally rampant, the European situation where there's been all kinds of, of backfilling and failures, or the Sinfuels thing, which was a total disaster. Well, I, I don't know that the green uh, agenda has been a total failure. I mean, the, I think the green agenda that came No, out, ethanol. I said ethanol. Well, uh, well look, the governments will fail. Private businesses will fail. Uh, government policy is not always right, but government policy can be frequently right. But when I mean, government policy created, for example, public universities, which is not a bad set of institutions, which is the foundation of research in this country, uh, applied and basic, which in turn is the foundation for technical innovation. Private businesses, when we talk about long term, like the internet, the Defense Department was subsidizing the internet for 40 years before it became commercialized. Then they handed it to the Bill Gates of the world. These are an interesting arguments, yeah. but there's, this is, I don't know if you've read Eisenhower's farewell address. About the military industrial complex? That's the one everyone knows. You know what the other warning he gave? Uh, not really. You know, it, he has two. He said because the military industrial complex, we were going to be investing a lot in R&D, and government would be funding that. And he warned that there was a risk that a government grant might substitute for intellectual curiosity, and the trust which we've long placed in our intellectuals might be subverted, and we might end ourselves up with a technocratic, scientific elite destroying democracy. And I think we've seen that in a whole area of environmental policies, but other areas too. There was a Lysenko issue still, in the 30s. But I still, no. I'm still asked getting, I'm, I'm not clear on your answer on this. If you have an industry, say fossil fuel production, that consequences on society are damaging, but there's no uh, immediate uh, uh, effect right. from the market to punish right. or capture right. that consequence. What are you going to do about it if you don't have government intervention? Well, government there is, is we're no not, choice. But we're not what talking about there? we're not talking about government intervention here. We're talking about well, green jobs. And his argument is that subsidizing green energy will somehow address externality. Where? Ethanol. We subsidized ethanol, and we ended up with a worse economy and no, a no. worse ecology. Uh, okay, if we, let's say we don't subsidize positive uh, green investments, but at the very least, uh, we have to punish, we have to increase the cost of fossil, burning fossil fuels to recognize the social costs. Because Only? there there are severe social costs oh, that are no, no. not getting captured in that's, price. That's look, CO two is very different. You think CO two is a pollutant? I think it's a residual byproduct of efficient use. Well, I'm not. Use. I'm not a climate scientist. I know. I, know. I don't claim well, to be. We're not. That's not the purpose. Yeah, yeah. Your purpose is you think green energy has value and above everything else. Look, but you know, we talked about the Spanish uh, uh, before the program, well, it's a very and Spain uh, yeah. was the green jobs model. Spain was applauding this. They had windmills. They had solar. It was going to be the new future for Spain and then for Europe, and they've backed away from that now because on well, analysis, a, it didn't a, work very well. There's a small problem that they've had a massive uh, recession, financial Well, in a crisis. recession, you would want to have your better industry surviving, not closing them down. Well, in a recession, we have all kinds of weird things well, going on. What, what is your read on Spain? Because you mentioned you'd, you'd investigated well, no, I know that I know that well-known study. I mean, number one. Uh, there was a study that criticized the program about a year or two years later. That is created right. controversy. Criticize the Spanish clean energy program. Yeah, yeah. In, in particular, in investment program. investments in wind energy. Right. Uh, and the, the point is this. Number one is, uh, that's why I emphasize energy efficiency, because right now we know the technologies are known. Right. The returns are known. Mm -hmm. uh, this is across the board. Uh, it's true that the, uh, the intermediate, the system of banking, intermediation, risk sharing is not uh, mature enough. 
And so I think in that sense, the role of the government is to encourage the private activity. Now, with wind energy and sol wind and solar are also very, very different because wind energy is almost to the point at which it's cost competitive in terms of generating electricity relative to coal. And if you actually tacked on a tax or a cap to recognize the social costs of coal, wind energy would be competitive today with coal. Uh, solar is not. And so I don't think we should subsidize solar to the extent that we subsidize efficiency because the main investment should be in getting the solar technology to the point it's competitive. But again, uh, if you don't have some vehicle for capturing those social costs, and this is not me, this is, as you acknowledge, this is actually a pretty conservative argument that you, if you're going to have a market, you also have to have some a uh, measure, some means to address these problems of what we call externalities, the fact that the market isn't uh, uh, capturing these costs. And it's clear that we're not capturing the cost. Okay, quick final word. Well, the whole question that I'd like, the, the, the question I think we have to address is whether an economy which has been producing energy efficiencies steadily for the last century, every year the U.S. uses less energy to produce a, a million dollars of output. We've been doing that steadily. It takes to argue that government can accelerate that process. No evidence at all that's true. And lots of evidence when government starts picking winners and losers, it can put us on a, a, a faster efficiency gain path rather, I mean, a slower than a faster one. And ethanol illustrates that. We okay. put a lot of emphasis on ethanol. We, we haven't debated ethanol, ethanol and that's a different debate. That's I a green we, jobs. It's yeah, green well, jobs. I think, uh, yeah. I don't know, though. A lot of people for green jobs will probably agree with you on ethanol, so. But they wouldn't have 10 years ago. Thanks well, for joining we learn. We learn. I'm, I'm willing to learn, you know. I am, too. Thank you, thank you both for joining us. <laughs> and thank you for joining us on the Real News Network.